Welcome to the Video Wine Guide. Tonight, we're going to meet some very special wines, and we're also going to meet a special guest. So I'd like you to give a big welcome now to my special guest. Wait a minute. This is the way you'd start a typical television special. And obviously, this isn't a television special. This is special television. Because you and I are pioneers in the exciting new world of home video. And you and I have a couple of things in common. We both like good television. And we both like good wine. So here's to you, pioneer. And I know that you and I are going to enjoy the next 90 minutes. Winemaking is subtle, beautiful, sometimes even a work of art. And it can also be very simple. Look, the thing is that wine actually makes itself. If I squeeze this juice in here manually, drop the whole mess into the glass, eventually the yeast in the skins will turn the sugar in the juice into alcohol. This is called fermentation and the result is wine. And the basic process is amazingly simple and the resulting wine could be simply amazing. Uh, on a four star scale, it would probably come in at about one dead planet. But to get a good glass of wine, that's where the basics come in. And the basics are skill, luck, and centuries of hard work. Growing wine grapes is farming, but in many ways, it's a kind of magical farming. It starts with location. Consider this. Out of 25 million acres of wine grapes worldwide, some of the greatest wines come from just four and a half acres. This is the legendary Romane Conti vineyard of France. And something about the sun, soil, and water coming together on this dot of land makes it the world's most famous vineyard. It's the magic of location. On this hillside in Burgundy, you can see the vineyard of more than a dozen labels. Twelve seemingly identical side-by-side -side vineyards can produce 12 very different wines. That's why many of the wine labels on the finest wines tell you exactly, sometimes to the meter, where the grapes in that bottle were grown. Something else that makes this farming special. The farmers make it tough on the vines. Vintners say the grapes have to struggle to greatness. In the early spring, they cut them back. Planters put several vines where there's only nourishment for one. And they keep the vines thirsty and keep them hungry. Of course, some forms of struggle don't help the crop. They kill it. In the spring, freezing temperatures are a grower's nightmare. And they're up until dawn sometimes, tending their heaters, fighting the killing frost. Something about great vineyard locations also attracts a great plague of problem pests. Beetles and bugs, moles and rust are a constant threat. So grape growing is rarely an organic operation. Before you're tempted to quit your job and start a romantic life on your own little vineyard, take a look at this man in Bordeaux. He's a farmer. And whether you're using horses or helicopters, growing wine grapes is farm work and that's hard work. There's an undeniable appeal to it, of course. And this farmer raises the world's most special crop. Growers tend to have stiff necks in August. That's because they're always looking up, searching the heavens for clues to the weather. Now, those cirrus clouds, for example, could spell the beginning of a rain spell that could prove disastrous for the season. So in August, vintners read their fortunes in the sky. Two weeks of wrong weather at a harvest can literally wash out the chances of a great year. Growers like Rodney Strong in California are in their fields using their refractometers and their taste buds. As the grapes ripen, their sugar increases and acidity drops. Growers are looking for the perfect balance. This time of year, the winemaker is watching the sky a lot and reading all the weather reports, including Alaska and South America, out of sheer nervousness that you can to see if there are any fronts coming in that might jeopardize your year's work. The decision of harvesting is vital in grape growing and winemaking because you've been working all year, cultivating, weeding, bringing them along, and then suddenly you must make this decision that really determines how excellent the wine is going to be at that moment. If they pick too soon, the growers will get a weak wine. Wait too long and the grapes may lose their quality to an early fall storm or heat spell. Once the growers do decide the perfect moment for picking, that moment has to be a long one. It takes at least two weeks to pick all the grapes in a good-sized vineyard. And now the crush. The grape growing is over and the winemaking begins. Red grapes make red, white, or rosé wine. The color doesn't come from the juice, it comes from the skins. To get red wine, 
the winemaker leaves the juice and the skins together. Special yeast is added to the mixture, and for about two weeks, the sugar and the grape juice ferments into alcohol. The liquid is then separated from the skins, and the wine is ready for aging. For the rosés, the juice is left with the skins just long enough to take on a pink blush, and then it's separated and fermented. For the whites, white or red grapes are pressed quickly after harvest to separate the juice from the skins. Fermentation is then slowed in refrigerated tanks to retain more of the fresh, fruity flavor. After fermentation, red wines are usually aged. The less expensive jug wines are often aged in huge tanks, and the aging itself is over quickly. The finer wines are aged for up to two years in $300 oak barrels. Full-bodied whites, like Chardonnay, are often aged briefly in wood. Light white wines are bottled fresh and are immediately ready to drink. Whether the winery is a family operation, like Ben Marl in New York, or one of the corporate giants, the basic processes are the same. But winemaking is a fine art, and there are thousands of choices. The winemaker's decisions will determine the quality of his finished wine. What type of press to use, what strain of yeast, how long to ferment, what type of wood in which to age, how big a barrel to use. This is called a wine thief. It's all right, I have permission to be here. But with the right vines, the right weather, and the right decisions, you will get not a finished wine, but a wine that, given time and enough aging in the bottle, might be a great wine. And that's the final necessary ingredient, time. Fully 1% of the world's population grows, makes, or sells wine. In parts of Europe, it's closer to one person out of every 10. Wine is a vital part of life here, and it has been for centuries. In places like Schloss Vollrads, above Germany's Rhine River, one family has been making wine for 34 generations. But wine itself goes back much farther. When man first emerged into recorded history, he was carrying a wine jug. Wine helped the Greeks celebrate their triumphs and probably to forget about their failures. Wine played a part in the classic theater of ancient Greece. The Dionysian festival celebrating wine generated an intensity of emotion later moved to the stage. And for the Romans, what would an orgy have been without wine? Pretty self-conscious, I'd suppose. Wine historians say this ancient wine was probably quite good. The Romans had developed closed containers for aging, a technique later lost during the Dark Ages. When the Romans traveled north, it wasn't for a friendly visit, but there was at least one friendly thing about their conquests. On their journeys, the Romans planted the vines that would one day become the great vineyards of Europe and help civilize the nomadic tribes. The charm of wine was enough to turn warriors into farmers. They brought the vine to Chianti and Barolo in Italy, to Bordeaux and Burgundy in France, to the Rhine and Mosul regions of Germany. Strangely, European vines grow on American roots, all of them. Now, how did this happen? Well, the story goes back to an insect, an American insect called Phylloxera, which destroys grapevine roots. The Native American vines had become immune to this pest, but in the 1800s, it traveled to Europe and nearly wiped out the whole European wine industry. But American rootstock to the rescue. The Europeans grafted American roots onto their vines and produced an immune vine so that the great vineyards were saved. And although wine history is largely European, when you get to its roots, it's American. In the 16th and 17th centuries, wine was enjoyed as much as it is today, but it was very different from what we're used to often murky with almost no bouquet. It was stored in barrels and in most regions was consumed close to where it was produced. You didn't cart one of those barrels home that easily. Then around 1700, an invention changed all of that. Some unknown hero created the cork. And wine has never been the same. It could now be aged in bottles, which created a bouquet and a wide range of subtleties. It could be shipped and stored easily, and eventually, it would be labeled. With the labels, 
came reputations, and that gave the winemakers a new incentive to produce good wines and new styles. Over hundreds of years of trial and error, the modern styles of wine evolved in each of the regions of Europe. Some of the real pleasures of wine come from its international character. You can sort of take your sensibilities on a world tour and never leave the bar. So on our Voyage du Vin, most of our stops will be in the United States and Europe. Guten Abend. Ah, guten Abend. Sie sprechen Deutsch ohne Akzent. Ja, ich bin Deutsche ohne Akzent. Oh, natürlich. We're speaking German for the moment. Hier ah. haben Sie einen Weißwein. Aha. Meine liebste Zeit und mein liebster Platz. Sonnenaufgang am Mose. Oh, das ist sehr schön gesagt. Um, she said her most favorite time, most favorite place, sunrise on the Mosul. Bonjour, monsieur. Comment allez-vous? Oh, bonsoir. Je vous ai Je ne sais pas, pour Cairo peut-être, ou Paris, ou Oui, Cairo. je voyage beaucoup. Ah. Vous savez, ce vin me rappelle le printemps à Paris. C'est vrai, oh, oh, que c'est très poétique. Um, as you know, she just said that reminds her of springtime in Paris. Mm. <laughs>